So we're coming to the end of our journey in exploring intercultural communication together. And so I wanted to take a few minutes to kind of wrap things up a little bit. And uh, so to to quote the late, great Paul Vasquez, uh, otherwise known as Double Rainbow Guy, um, one of the first viral videos on YouTube, of course, uh, was the Double Rainbow. And as Paul uh, was just so enamored with this Double Rainbow that, of course, as we all know, was all the way across the sky, man. But the most important question maybe that he asked during uh, that whole experience and that fun video that we all got to enjoy is, what does it mean? What does it all mean? And I think that's a, that's a fair question. That's a great question we ought to be asking about uh, a lot of things in life. But uh, as, as it relates to us, we're going to ask that about intercultural communication because, you know, really intercultural communication is, a, is an ongoing process. Developing our cultural skills and our intercultural communication skills is an ongoing process. It really, uh, truly never ends. Never end. So it's, it's so we need to ask ourselves, well, what does it all mean? It's such a big part of our life. What does it all mean? Where are we going with this? And why is all of this important? And and how do we use it? Really, that I mean, how do we use this? How do we apply this new knowledge that we've gained? So let's take a few minutes to talk about how we can expand our cultural competence. Okay, we've been talking about intercultural communication, so we're going to talk about expanding our cultural competence. So if we jump all the way back in this video series toward the very beginning and, and look at the definition for intercultural competence here, um, we define it simply as engaging with people from differing cultures in a manner that is both effective and appropriate within a given context. Simple enough, straightforward. And one of the things we, uh, we also looked at in an earlier video is the, um, the, the work from Dr. Darla Deardorff, who uh, in intercultural competence, who in 2006 put forward this kind of model. And what part of that was this pyramid model of intercultural competence. We want to use this as a framework of sorts to to kind of uh, frame our discussion uh, on how we can expand our intercultural competence, because I think this gives us a great roadmap for moving forward here and how we can do that, how we can continue to expand our cultural competence and our intercultural communication skills. So as you may recall, Dr. Deardorff, um, set forth that, uh, that we have to start with the requisite attitudes and developing those. And then we move into developing our knowledge and comprehension, as well as kind of simultaneously developing our intercultural skills and the skills that are required for that. Then we move into uh, developing the desired internal and external outcomes. So I want to take a look at these individually here, just briefly look at each of these stages and see how uh, that means for us. So let's start with the requisite attitudes. And so I want to talk about what I like to call the, the B attitudes. That's a little play on words, right? If you're familiar with the B attitudes, but, but the B attitudes uh, in this case for cultural growth have to do with uh, ways of being, right? So we want to be these things. We want to, want to, um, uh, you know, take these on as kind of, um, mantras and, 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 and as, as for our attitudes, the way we approach life, the way we approach the world. Um, we, we ought to start by being curious. We got to want to know what's out there and be curious. Uh, if we don't, if we're comfortable right here in our bubble and we have no desire to ever see anything again, I mean, I guess that's fair, but you're going to be missing a lot. We have to really cultivate that curiousness, right? And cultivate that attitude of curiousness that really drives us forth to want to see these places. I don't know. Uh, we love this show in our house, the, um, Reluctant Traveler with Eugene Levy here, uh, is he, who you see in this picture. Uh, he admits that he doesn't like necessarily new things or different things. And so he has this show though, where he goes out and travels and does different things and does neat things, explores these things. And, and, uh, he is reluctant to do so as the title would indicate, but he does it because he's curious. He wants to know what's out there. You know, he's, he's not real comfortable with it, but he wants to know. We have to have that curiosity. So you have to have an attitude of being curious. Number one, you have to be open to new ideas, be open to new ideas. Um, understand that, you know, I'm not saying you have to accept every new idea or endorse every new idea, but you have to be open to the idea that or to the fact that there are, there could potentially be things out there that you don't know about or different ways of doing things than you might normally do them. That would be, you know, just as good, if not better. Right. Um, but there are, you know, regardless, you have to have that attitude of, OK, I don't know everything. And uh, and and even if I did, there may be different ways of doing things than I'm thinking of them. So we have to be open to these new ideas and really and, you know embrace that attitude of being open to those things. We have to be an active listener. Uh, you have to have this attitude of, of I'm going to 
focus on my listening, which is not an easy skill. If you haven't really focused on this, then you may not be as good a listener as you think you are, uh, because we have to really cultivate those and, and develop those active listening skills. But we have to have that attitude of, um, it has to be part of our attitude that I'm going to be an active listener. I have to be committed to that. We have to be honest with ourselves and we have to know who we are. We have to be honest about ourselves, both in positive and negative ways, right? And, you know, areas we have room to improve, but also in the positive ways, things we do well, uh, who am I? And, and that's going to help us understand who other people are and appreciate who other people are, even if it's different from us, even if they're very, very different from us. Uh, we have to be honest with ourselves, both be honest um, with ourselves and about ourselves to uh, so be honest with and about yourself um, is, is an, an important attitude and the, the willingness to do that. We have to be flexible with an ad attitude of flexibility in some ways. I mean, it's good to have a plan. It's good to know where you're going and, and, uh, and to know what you're doing and, and knowledge is good, but you also have to leave room to go with the flow. Right? You have to be flexible when things um, change. You got to be like that slinky, right? The classic toy from when I was a kid, this was a, this was a major toy when I was a kid. That's how old I am. All right. So I, we have, but we have to be flexible. We have to have the ability to kind of, you know, ooze around, right? Like when I was a kid and I told my mom, there's always room for pudding, right? We can, I can always fit more pudding in, even if I'm full, I can put, because it'll just, it'll just fill in the cracks, right? It'll just ooze around. That's how we have to be. We have to be flexible and go with the flow sometimes and really um, be willing to just kind of see where life leads us in some ways, right? So we have to have that attitude of, I'm going to go with it, go with things and, uh, and, and go with the flow. And we have to be patient. Um, I, I have a guitar player on here to kind of illustrate this because I, I play guitar really poorly, but I play guitar and I'll tell you one of the, it took me forever to even get started playing guitar because it is, it can be hard to learn. I'm really super jealous of people who pick it up just immediately. One of our kids did. I mean, he just picked it up and immediately had an understanding of what he was doing and was able to do it. It took me a long time uh, and I, I would put it down and come back to it and put it down and come back to it. We have to be patient with ourselves. These are not things that are going to come easily necessarily. Um, some will come more easily than others, but we have to have an attitude of patience, being patient with ourselves, being patient with others, and and being patient with perhaps different circumstances and things. So we have to have an attitude of, okay, this is just, it is what it is, and I'm going to just go with it. I'm going to be flexible. I'm going to go with it. I'm going to uh, be open to these things, and and um, but I'm going to be patient in all of this. And, and that's a hard thing for a lot of us, myself included to do, but, uh, but that's the attitude we have to have. So these are the be attitudes, meaning again, these are the things that we have to tell ourselves, I have to be this, I have to be curious. I have to be open to new ideas, be an active listener, be honest with myself. I have to be flexible and, and I really do have to be patient. So we need to be all of these things that will help us develop the requisite attitude for developing and, and improving intercultural competence. Um, next up, we had um, knowledge and comprehension, right? So you know, knowledge is power. That's an old expression. Knowledge is power. The more we know, uh, then the more power we will have in that situation. And it's really power over others. It's not what I mean by power, but I mean power to make effective decisions, power to um, have better understanding of things and power to uh, uh, perceive things in uh, a significant way, right? And have discernment. So knowledge is power, especially in intercultural communication. So to develop our knowledge, um, and so to, to learn these things and develop our knowledge and comprehension of intercultural communication and intercultural competence and other cultures in general, we first have to, um, observe, we have to observe, we just have to, you know, pay attention to how things are done and how things are different and how they're the same and, and, uh, and how I'm behaving and how that fits in with everything. We just have to observe others, right? Observe others. So the kind of a, a lesser known movie called the 13th warrior, right? Long time ago, Antonio Banderas. And he plays this guy who's from, um, Persia, I think is what it was at that time. Um, and he's gets in trouble and gets sent off to be the ambassador or whatever to Scandinavia. And so, but he gets hooked up with these Vikings basically, right? And he doesn't speak the language and, uh, but he eventually learns and they're amazed. How did you learn a language? And he basically said, he said, well, I listened, right? But really what he did is he just observed and you can see in the movie, he's just watching them and listening to them and connecting words with actions. And oh, so that word means this. And, and, uh, but he's also observing their, their, um, their behaviors and their, their, uh, just the way they, uh, relate to and behave with one another. And he just spends a lot of time observing. And that's such an important quality. If we're going to learn, we have to be willing to just 
kind of take it in and, and pay attention and observe these things. We can also read. We can, I love to read. And I, I'm, you know, most of the knowledge that I have is, is totally random stuff, but it's from what I read. And uh, so reading is an excellent way, not only to expand our vocabulary, but also to know about other cultures and learn history and learn uh, what their, you know, customs and things like that are. So we can read, we can do some research and read and uh, to understand different cultures. <clears throat> we can ask some people. If we know somebody who's a part of that culture, we can ask them, hey, can you tell me a little bit about this? Or I'm, I'm going to be in this situation. How should I behave in, when I go to a business meeting? How should I behave when I go to someone's home for dinner? How should We can ask somebody who has knowledge of these things. That's always a, a smart thing to do, right? Is ask somebody who knows already. And we can learn that. We can gain knowledge from other people. And then on the flip side of that, we can share. And that's that also is going to enhance our knowledge because when we share, others will share. And so... We can have round, you know, work. We can have roundtables and say, "Hey, here's what I know about this culture," and then we can attend other things where people talk about cultures that they understand. Or we can, so we can share and exchange knowledge in that way, and so we can we can enhance our knowledge and our comprehension by observing, by reading, by asking, by sharing, and mostly just just taking in any information that we can, and in whatever form it takes, and however it comes to us, and whatever we're doing, we need to gain that knowledge, gain that understanding. Right. Uh, so our intellectual understanding of that of that uh, uh, culture needs to be very strong. Then we also need to develop our intercultural skills. So that's the, that was the kind of simultaneously we're, we're work as I said we're working on our knowledge, but also at the same time we're, we're practicing. Right, we're doing these things, and and that's uh, the first key is really practice, practice, pra practice. Uh, if you're familiar with Malcolm Gladwell and his book, uh, I'll already talked about um, the the idea of ten thousand hours. Right. And uh, 10,000 hours to master your craft. And you can see that that would be eight hours a day, five days a week, 44 weeks a year for five and a half years. Uh, if we were really going to master something and that doesn't mean it has to happen in just like that. But uh, um, but over time, you know, you collect these hours and when you do something enough times, you get that repetition. And that has to be good repetition, though. Obviously, if you do it the wrong way a bunch of times, it's not going to help you. But but practicing and practicing well uh, is going to be critical to developing our skills. So it's it's one of those things we just have to keep on. We have to keep practicing, keep, keep trying it out, keep working at it, right? So practice, practice, practice. Uh, also, you know, we can make a lot. I can tell you from experience, you can make a lot of ground, make up a lot of ground really quickly through what we call immersion. So you can immerse yourself in this culture. Um, sometimes that means going there. I had the opportunity when I was in high school to go live in Spain with a family, and they did not speak English. Uh, I was surrounded by people who did not speak English, and and was really incredibly fortunate to live with this amazing family who was really patient with me because I had the vocabulary of like a three-year-old. So they were really patient with me, but I, I came back and, uh, and I, again, I went over, I did not have the greatest understanding of Spanish. I had a willingness to go and I love traveling and doing that kind of stuff. That's what took me there. Not a really advanced knowledge of Spanish. But when I came back, I then I was I was entering my senior year of high school, and I tested uh, to uh, and went to the college I was going to attend and tested out of um, what I could in Spanish. And I was amazed. I tested out of everything possible. I tested into the three hundred level classes, I'm just mostly based on immersing myself. It's a, that's how the army does it too. If they want to teach you a language, they drop you in this program. They have an incredible program, language program. They drop you in this program and you are not allowed to speak English. You have to learn. If you want to know where the bathroom's at, you better learn how to say it in that language. If you want to order some food, you better learn how to say it in that language because you don't have a choice. And we find when we don't have a choice, then we start learning so much faster and we develop these skills and they just become natural to us, right? When we're living day to day in that world, then uh, then it just becomes part of our life, it becomes, uh, you know, as natural as anything else to us. So if we immerse ourselves and uh, and sometimes we have the opportunity to do that by going entirely someplace and, and living in that moment. But other times it's just, you know, even if you're just practicing by yourself um, for, for a short period of time at home, you can really focus and immerse yourself in that world and uh, and uh, just commit yourself to that. So immerse yourself and develop your, you know, that'll help you develop your skills. Get back on the horse. This is a really important one. I can't stress this enough. These things are tough. Uh, if you remember learning how to do anything, right? I, I talk about learning how to play guitar. It didn't come easily to me. I had to put it down sometimes for a while because I got so frustrated. It was either that or smash it like I was a rock star on stage, right? But uh, but I did. I put it down and came back to it. But I got back on the horse. Uh, when things don't go your way, when you're developing any kind of skill, 
you've got to have that attitude of I fell down, but now I get up and then I'll probably fall down again and then I'm going to get up, but I'm going to fall down. As long as you get up one more time, then you fall down, then you're winning. Right. Uh, but you've got to get back on that horse when you try things and you go places and you try these skills out, these cultural skills and you fail, you get it wrong for whatever reason. You have to learn from that and get up and try it again and keep getting better and better and better. Right. Um, so get back on the horse. That's a critical skill, a critical mindset for developing intercultural skills, for whatever skill you're trying to develop. And then I really can't stress this one enough either. You just have to embrace the awkward. Sometimes when you're, you know, again, when you're trying to experience it you do, and you get it wrong, you just want to put your head in the sand, right? It's embarrassing to get things wrong and to not understand things and to, to be in a weird situation where you're not really comfortable. It can be awkward, right? It can feel awkward. And it just is what it is. You just have to embrace that and say, okay, if I'm awkward, it must mean I'm in a, an opportunity to learn. Um, if I'm, if it's not awkward, you're probably not learning anything. Right. Um, so you have to embrace that mindset. So, for example, uh, again, when I went to Spain and, and when people travel uh, to different cultures where kissing on the you know cheek is, is common as a greeting. Um, and first to understand that at least where I was at, um, it was not a true kiss. It was like this was kind of an air kiss next to your face. Right. It wasn't really kissing the other, but, but it's still that's pretty close contact. And you're doing that a lot. And um, and it could be awkward at first, but you can either say, you know, no, thank you. And shove people away or whatever. And that's, that's not going to be great, uh, right. For getting to know people and, and, you know, <clears throat> and it was not, as long as it's not causing you like actual physical harm, you just have to embrace the awkward and say, well, this feels a little weird, but let me give it a shot. That's what they do here. So, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, right. And when and wherever do as they do again, as long as it's not violating your, your, you know, ethical standards or religious practices or, or putting you in harm's way in some way or whatever. But if it's a little awkward, you know, that's just part of it. You got to learn to accept that. Um, and it's not just going to other countries, right? Uh, we just have to embrace the awkward. And sometimes, you know, embracing is awkward in and of itself. Right? I was thinking of the big bang theory and the, you know, probably the, what I think was the most was the neatest relationship in that whole show was, was actually Penny and, and, um, uh, and Sheldon, right? And they were never romantically involved, of course, but they had this really unique relationship and, and it grew over time. And you could tell that, it, that he got more and more comfortable uh, in a relative way uh, with her. And he did with, the, with uh, of course, uh, Amy Farrah Fowler as well, but uh, um, in, in a different way as they got you know married, of course. But um, you just have to embrace the awkward and say, OK, this is weird. This is weird. It's uncomfortable. But I'm going to get through it. It's not hurting me physically. I'm going to do it. I'm going to I'm going to make it work because this is how you learn about other cultures. So and develop those skills. If it's again, if it doesn't feel awkward, you're probably not developing any skills because that's not really an opportunity to learn if you're not in a position that, that feels a little awkward. So just embrace it and go with it because it means you're doing something right. OK, so let's talk about some internal outcomes. And um, um, what we mean by that are things that we have to be able to do uh, internally. So again, developing those skills and, and behaviors and things like that. But these are really internal um, attitudes and values and and things that we um, by internal, I mean, the, they are internalized for us and they become just a part of how we live our lives really on a day to day basis. They become that ingrained within us. Uh, so as we develop our intercultural competence, these are things that ought to be, you know, really just part of our, our natural state of being uh, over time. One is flexibility. Again, we bring the slinky back. I can't go wrong with a slinky. It, you can't get much more flexible than that. Right. Um, so, um, we will be flexible. We will find ourselves flexible when we enter a situation. The stronger our in, our uh, intercultural competence becomes, um, that will be something that we embrace and that it will be kind of internalized and something that we just kind of do naturally without um, really having to think about it. We just are become more flexible and become willing to adjust and, and to, um, to, to try new things and to, um, and to, do things, you know, color outside of the lines a little bit, right? Have that kind of flexibility, however you want to phrase it. Uh, we need that to be part of our internal value system, in a sense, right? Adaptability is another. We have to be able to enter a situation and quickly adjust. 
and and adapt and and uh, and be okay with that and just make that again a normal part of our uh, of our being because every situation uh, is different not you know the same thing's not going to work the same way in every situation we've got to learn from that experience and then be able to adapt and adjust. Um, one example that always comes to mind for me of this is uh, from The Office. I, I'm a long, long, long time fan of The Office, um, and I, both the British and the American version. But this is, I'm going to talk about the American version because uh, I'm always reminded of this when I think of when Jim in The Office went to the Stanford branch, right? He left the Scranton branch, went over the Stanford branch, and we met some really cool new people there. Uh, one of the first things we saw, though, is that he pulled the classic you know, calculator or stapler, whatever it is. He put something of Andy's in jello, just like he did with Dwight. Right? He did it with Dwight. We saw it in like the first episode of the show and it was hilarious and it's, everybody loved it. Right. It's got a, you know, um, it's kind of classic, right? So he did it with Andy, right? He's new at the Stanford branch. He wants to make an impression. So he puts Andy's, uh, calculator in, um, uh, and in jello. And of course it was really funny. Nobody knew he did it. He was he's smiling, he's smirking, you know, we see him really having fun with it. Uh, but then things kind of go sideways because unlike the situation with Dwight earlier where everybody was laughing, Dwight wasn't laughing, but everybody else was laughing. Uh, Andy did not find this funny. He got up, he kicked the trash can, had a little outburst. He was really angry about it. And of course, then Jim uh, got very uncomfortable and uh, really just kind of went back to work and kind of quietly went back to work and and, and ignored the situation. Um, he learned very quickly that things are not always the same you know, what worked in Scranton doesn't always work in Stanford, right? So you've got to adapt. And eventually he did. And to be fair, on the flip side, Andy had to adapt a lot when he came over to the Scranton branch eventually, right? We know that he had some frustrations, really got angry, put his hand through that wall a couple times. He punched through the wall, right? So if you're, again, if you're familiar with the office, you know that. And we know that Andy had a journey uh, throughout the show. His story arc took quite, you know, he took on several different person personalities in a sense and and really grew throughout the show his character did and changed evolved i guess i should say not necessarily grew i don't know if he really grew but um, but he evolved um and he adapted though he had to adapt to a different setting because what worked in stanford didn't work in scranton he had to um adjust in a sense and he you know was better about that at times than than others at some times than others but uh and then in the end, of course, you know, he and Jim became friends. They became partners. They became, you know, I wouldn't say necessarily BFFs, but they were, they became friends and, and, and respected one another over time and were able to adapt in their own relationship as well. So we have to have that ability to say, okay, I'm, I'm run up against something. So I, now I've got to figure out how to get around that and do it differently. And then when next, you know, I get to another uh, closed door, I got to figure, okay, let me adapt here and try it differently. We've got to be able to adjust and adapt. And those have to be just kind of our natural states of being uh, to think that way. Uh, the last one here for internal outcomes that is really critical is reframing. We've got to have a mindset of reframing. We've got to get out of this mindset of um, everything's either good or bad or right or wrong or whatever. Sometimes things are just different. Now, that's not to say there aren't things that are good or bad or right or wrong. We have value systems. We have morals. We have ethics, right? And those determine those things. But uh, sometimes, especially when we think about culture, culture is not about good or bad. Culture is about different, right? And uh, as uh, uh, Lauren Potter, who's an actress um, who was on the television show Glee, if you remember that, was a little while ago now, but she was Glee. She played um, Sue's a cheerleader kind of assistant. She was the young lady who has Down syndrome. Right? She has Down syndrome and, and she pointed out different isn't bad. It's just different. That's it. It's different. Different is not good. It's not bad necessarily. It's just, it's just different. And that's it. And that's culture. Culture is not different, good or different, bad necessarily. Sometimes culture is just different. Most of culture is just different, not good or bad. It's just different perspectives. We have to be able to reframe and say, okay, I see it this way, but they're seeing it differently. So does that make it bad? No, not necessarily. Cause sometimes people see things differently, right? I love this comic. <clears throat> the guy on the island is so excited to see a boat. The guy in the boat is so excited to see land, uh, almost like they're just going to trade places or something because they're so tired of, of what they've had that, that anything, di their, their perspective on the situation is just, uh, so different. They're seeing complete opposite, uh, uh, um, benefits here, right? Um, now, uh, it's not necessarily as simple as the, the boss from Dilbert would put it and just say, from now on, we will refer to our problems as opportunities. That's a great way to look at it in, in many respects, though. 
Um, if, if a problem can be seen as an opportunity, sometimes problems are just a problem, but sometimes they're opportunities, opportunities for us to grow and opportunities uh, for us to learn something new and to experience something new. And that's wonderful, right? Um, so we have to be willing to reframe it in that, in that uh, mindset and have that mindset, right? So, you know, when we see uh, the, the storm coming, right? Sometimes people always see as the clouds, right? That's all we see is the clouds and they, oh, it overtakes, you know, the sun is, very dim, not not just in the sky, but in our mind. Um, and, and sometimes that's how our, our life gets to, right? We can't see the sunshine. We can only see the clouds. But in, in as much as possible, uh, our, our, our mental state is so important. And uh, so we've got to be able to reframe and say, okay, no, the, it's not that the clouds aren't there, but they're not my focus. I'm going to focus on that sun. I'm going to really frame it up to I, so I'm seeing the sun. I'll deal with the rain. It's not that, not that we can ignore the rain in the storm. We have to uh, understand that and respect it, but we can focus on the sun. We can choose to see it as, I grew up in farm country. Rain is good. Oftentimes there, we need rain to help the crops grow. Um, we need rain to avoid drought. And uh, so, I mean, rain can be a good thing. Of course, we don't want it all the time, but, but there, there are positives to rain, but we can reframe it and say, I'm going to see the sun here. I'm going to choose to see the sun. Uh, and so when we're in um, situations where we're in a different culture and, and things are just odd, things are different, again, they're awkward, maybe, we can choose to see that as an opportunity right? instead, of, uh, instead of only seeing the negatives and only seeing the downsides. So finally, we get to external outcomes. So we've talked about how we how this will affect us internally, right? But externally, what does this mean for our external behaviors and, and things? So I've come, we come back to this definition again. Intercultural competence is in, you know, intercultural communication is engaging with people from different cultures in a manner that is both effective and appropriate within that context. So really, our, our, our scoreboard for all of this is effective and appropriate effective and appropriate. And so um, our goal, if we were to think about, okay, we've got these two things, effective and appropriate. So if we put out the, if we pull out this, real, you know, the classic Venn diagram, of course, our, our goal is to be somewhere in the middle. We want to be effective, of course, and we want to be appropriate, but ideally we will be, we will be both effective and appropriate in our behaviors. Um, <clears throat> so it's important to keep in mind also though, that uh, Effective is going to be determined by you. Effective behavior is determined by the individual. By that we mean um, we have a goal in every every communication interaction that we have. We have a goal. There's some purpose to that. Um, whether that purpose is to uh, get someone to buy something or to give someone directions or if it's just to develop and maintain a relationship and just to you know help fuel that relationship. Maybe that's what that interaction is about. But we have a goal. And so we are determining ourselves. We are the ones who determine whether or not is this, this exchange is effective because we're the ones identifying for us what is our goal here. Or other people are as well. They have their goals, but we're identifying what is my goal here. So whether or not an, a behavior, an intercultural you know, behavior is effective really is, is uh, determined by us. Is it, is it allowing us to achieve our goal in that situation? So is that, is that behavior effective? And that's determined by you. Now, the other side of things, appropriate, that's determined by everybody else, either the other person or persons, depending on the situation. Um, appropriate is determined by the rest of the group. It's dependent by, it's determined by everybody else. Um, whether or not they see your behavior as appropriate in that situation. Now, those two are connected, of course, obviously. And that's why we want to have both because if you behave appropriately, you're more likely to behave effectively and, and achieve your goals, of course. Right. Um, and so effective behavior then in turn is ideally appropriate because it's going to help you achieve your goals. Right? So, um, it's, it's kind of a, a you know, a, a cycle there you get in this kind of circular uh, motion of effective and appropriate, uh, effective helps you be appropriate which helps you be effective, which helps you be appropriate, which helps you be effective, right? So, uh, but we need to be both. We want to keep both in mind, but you determine, and, and, you know, in the end, you're going to score it, whether or not it was effective and other people though, are going to identify and determine whether or not it was appropriate. Okay. So we need to understand both sides of that equation. So in the end, though, we, you know, we have that pyramid model. The other thing that Dr. Deardorff um, extended with, or, and, and provided was for this framework was this process. And what does this look like? 
as a process, well, it starts with, you know, the entrance point there is attitudes and that's where we get on the track, right? Attitudes and, and then the attitudes will fuel and feed our, our knowledge and comprehension and, and our development of skills, which as I said, we're kind of, are, are really kind of connected. They happen simultaneously and note that both of those areas are really individual things or things we do as individuals, um, and not, not determined by others and not affected by others. Well, I mean, it's affected by others, but, but really these are things that we work on as individuals, right? our attitudes and then our knowledge and comprehension and our skills are things that we primarily develop as an individual. Then the determined or desired, I uh, moves into to the desired internal outcomes, which then feed our desired external outcomes, which are, as we said, affected by interaction. They're determined by interaction because they are the appropriateness uh, aspect of it is determined by uh, the other people. So, um, so interaction is key for both of those things are desired internal and, and external outcomes. Individual becomes a really important bridge there. Okay. Interaction does. So. And then all of that is going to feed our attitudes. If it goes well, it's going to help us develop a positive attitude. If it doesn't, then it's either going to challenge us or it's going to maybe diminish our attitude a little bit, maybe give some more negative attitude, but either way, it's going to affect our attitudes, which is then again, starts this cycle all over again. So we go through these, these steps of the process of intercultural competence as well with all those things that I just mentioned. Now, the last thing I want to mention is something I've already talked about again in another video, and that is that pro we have to put progress over perfection. Uh, developing these uh, skills and, and this knowledge and things is an imperfect process. As I said, we're going to fall down. We've got to get back on the horse. We're going to fall down. We've got to get up. We're going to fall down. Then again, we've got to get back up. And that's what I mean by, but every time, hopefully when we fall down, we're taking lessons away from that. We're learning from that. We're um, experiencing new knowledge and understanding and appreciation for a culture. And that's progress. That's important. Uh, we have to put those things over this idea of a perf perfect interaction. So over perfection, uh, we can't get hung up on, well, that didn't go well. So why try again? Well, because we're making progress. This whole thing is a process, right? And we're making progress a little bit day by day, right? If you can improve a little bit day by day, that's progress. You don't have to hit perfection every day. You just need to make a step forward. That's all we can really hope for. Okay. If you have questions about any of, of, uh, of this, uh, I hope that you'll reach out via email. I'd love to hear from you there. Um, but I hope you have a, a fuller understanding then of not only how we can expand our cultural competence uh, through the, the, you know, the techniques we talked about today and the strategies we talked about in this video, but also through the other videos in this series. And, uh, and I hope this has been helpful and informative for you as you've um, begun the process of improving your own intercultural communication skills.